Already uh, this morning, I've been talking about the uh, the protests that happened in uh, well various parts of New Zealand, in particular in uh, central Auckland over the weekend. Uh, Protests about the situation unfolding in Gaza. And as I did mention at the top of the program, this is the sort of topic which whichever opinion you have on it, you're likely to annoy somebody. That includes friends, that includes uh, people at church, that includes workmates, it includes family members, even people that you're married to may get very angry about the opinion that you have, or even if you don't have an opinion that they think that you should have, this is certainly a contentious issue. What do we do about um, contentious issues like this one, particularly as the body of Christ? Joining us on the program now, um, Reuben Munn from Laidlaw and also from Shaw Community Church. Reuben, kia ora. Thank you for your time today. Kia ora, Andrew. Good to be with you, first, even on this contentious topic. Yeah, firstly, thank you for for stepping into the fray in, in this regard. Now, as a, as a pastor of a community church, um, there will be people in your congregation who have uh, different views and very, very passionate, very strongly held views on this particular yeah. topic. What do you do with that pastorally? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, we've got the full spectrum. And, and, and for some people, they're a bit more ambivalent around these things. Others, they hold it really strongly, really deeply. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, Israeli Christians in our church community, and so they're, they're carrying this particularly strongly. And I think pastorally, one of the things that I encourage people to think about is, is that when we think about the body of Christ, we have brothers and sisters in Christ on both sides yeah. of this conflict. You know, there are, there are many... Israeli Christians, Messianic Jews, uh, worshipping not not just in Israel, but around the world uh, in various congregations. And they carry that deep grief, that profound sense of of grief for what has happened uh, to them and and to people within Israel through the Hamas attacks. And then, of course, there are many Palestinian Christians. And this is something I think Christians sometimes don't realise or don't take enough account of, that we have brothers and sisters in Christ within the Palestinian territories as well, including within Gaza. Uh, churches there and Christians there uh, who desire the same peace that we desire, uh, who want nothing to do with Hamas, uh, but just long to live in safety and to be able to be the people of God in that part of the world. And so I think just knowing that the church is represented on both sides of that security perimeter that goes around Gaza, that we have brothers and sisters in both of those places. And so we can be grieved and angered um, when we see violence against Israel and when we see violence against the Palestinian people. And we need to grieve over both and we need to lament over both and we need to pray for Israel, for the peace of Israel, and also pray for the peace of Gaza and pray for the, pe- the peace of the Palestinian people. It is very difficult to be neutral on this. Uh, and even in that, that's, that statement that you made, praying for peace on both sides, uh, mm. for, for people with strongly held opinions, whether they're protesting in the streets or uh, commenting on the Facebook feeds, are very difficult to hold that middle ground. And, um, I mean, there's, there's good biblical historical reasons for this. Yes, the recent conflict is what we're protesting about, but I think this might be one of the oldest uh, geopolitical conflicts in the world in terms of, I suppose, how far its roots go back. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I think it's naive to think that this all started on in October when Hamas attacked Israel. It has long history. The modern history of this, of course, goes back to the formation of Israel as a, as a nation state in 1948, uh, and then subsequent wars, 1967, and so on since then. But as you say, that the threads of this conflict um, do go back, and, and they're deeply entrenched within our own scriptures. And the way in which Christians interpret different scriptures around this are going to influence how they see the modern conflict. And, you know, we, we're not going to have time to go into all of the threads here, but but one of those issues is around how you interpret the promise of land in the Bible, for example, the promise given to Abraham, like really clearly in the Old Testament, there is that promise of, of quite a specific piece of land, which is more or less equivalent to the modern nation state of Israel. Mm-hmm. But I think we, we need to really carefully bring that promise through the New Testament. Um, and see what happens to it. And you don't have in the New Testament quite the same uh, or really any emphasis on this physical uh, land specifically. What you see is that all this language in the Old Testament that's used of the land, like the land is our rest and the land is our inheritance, all of this gets taken up into fulfillment in the person of Jesus. He is our inheritance now. He is our rest. 
and we find that fulfillment in him. And if you want a physical fulfillment to the, the, the specific promise of land, we don't need to go any further than the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth. Yeah. There's that sense now that the, the promise is not just for one specific piece of land in the Mediterranean, but that eschatological promise that one day the people of God will reign with Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth, and the whole earth will be the Lord's. And that's that's ultimately our inheritance. So Christians will disagree on some of the details, and there may be people listening that would you know, take, take issue with some of those things, and that's fine. These are differences that we can have among Christians. But I'm just showing how that the way in which we follow these threads of the promise of land, even the identity of Israel itself, will determine some of the ways in which we interpret what's happening now in this modern day conflict. I mean, that um, it's, it's a quote from Jesus in the same sermon, of course, he said, blessed be the peacemakers. How yes. can we be peacemakers in a situation like this? Even calling for a ceasefire or even saying or asking for peace for for Jerusalem, for Gaza, for um what is a holy land for for many different faiths yes even even calling for peace can be problematic mm. at the at the moment right yeah it, it does it almost seems naive doesn't it to pray for peace but that's exactly what we're called to do uh we're called to, to pray for any places where the world is in pain and this is certainly in our world at the moment one of those places uh, i think we can be encouraged that even though we see all of this bad news in the media and so on there are people in in both palestinian territories and israel really working for that peace both israelis and palestinians and there's there's grassroots community initiatives and Christian work that is going on to try and bring people together and to try and have people sharing their stories and to try and just in simple ways, maybe just person to person, family to family, community to community, seek that sense of uh, shalom in Hebrew or, or uh, in Arabic, salam, mm -hmm. uh, peace. And, and as Christians, you know, here we are on the other side of the world, we feel very helpless. But the most important thing we can be doing is praying for that peace praying for our brothers and sisters that are pursuing that peace genuinely yep. and praying that there will be more and more of that reconciliation. I think it's good to pray both at the level of uh, everyday people in Palestine and Israel, but also praying for peace among those leaders who are making decisions, both the leadership of Hamas and the leadership of Israel, and praying that there would be soft hearts, hearts of reconciliation, hearts that genuinely desire to see a good outcome for both people. And we can pray that regardless of our political, theological persuasions to pray for God's peace to come. And we know that God is faithful and he does hear our prayers. So that is our greatest calling, I think, to pray. I mean, peace is such an important thing to pray for, but there's also in the New and the Old Testament, there's also a call for justice. And of course, mm -hmm. unjust things have happened on both mm -hmm. sides. Yes. Uh, the, the, there is also a place for saying, well, not peace at the expense of justice, that there should yes. be consequences for uh, the actions, that we should be a, a candle in the darkness. We should push back against evil. Sometimes mm. that involves taking a stand. It, it's not just, oh, well, we just all need to hold hands and, and, and sing songs together. Actually, sometimes there needs to be a call for justice where injustice is seen. Yes, no, that's that's very true, and and we should be people of justice. I think the key, though, the point I would make is that our focus on justice should be on restorative justice, yep. not re, not retributive justice, which just seeks that escalating. This is what you see is is, you know, we can we can say there should be consequences, and there should be, and Israel does have a right to defend itself, uh, and and Palestinian people uh, when they sense attack, they have that same right, but this just so quickly escalates and then just becomes a spiral of escalating violence that's retributive justice yeah. so as christians we should be saying yes there does need to be that sense of justice but wrongs do need to be righted and they need to be remedied and that's where there, there is such a broad history here uh, and and there are genuine grievances on both sides yeah. and both groups i mean this is where you know the geopolitics kicks in, kicks in but both groups have a sense of claim to the land. Mm -hmm. Both groups, in some sense, see themselves as the indigenous people of that land in different ways, and we might see that differently. Uh, but yes, so we need to be prepared to, to see, those, see those nuances, to recognize that justice is really complex, but to seek and to pray for the kind of justice that can be genuinely restorative, yeah. work towards the mending of relationships, the redressing of wrongs, but with a view towards people who can live um, together, and I know that it might seem naive just to say, "Well, you know, you know, it just seems like a pipe dream that people could ever just coexist like this." But mm -hmm. 
you only need to think back to the late 19th century, early 20th, early 20th century. That's exactly what Palestine was yeah. before the, before there was the sort of uh, Israeli Zionist movement or a strong Arab nationalist movement. There was a country under the Ottoman Empire and the late Ottoman Empire that w where Christians, Jews and Muslims could coexist quite peacefully. Now, I'm sure that wasn't without its troubles. It was also problematic, uh, but yes, but we don't have time to yep. get into the details. Just as we finish up, though, Ruben, just wanted your advice. I mean, we, we pray for peace, we pray for shalom, but what about peace and shalom here in amongst our church families and amongst our own communities? How do we find a place of peace with those people that may have different opinions? Is it just a, a, ma a matter of, look, biting your tongue and not saying anything and not escalating mm. in terms of our own conversations for the sake of the relationship. What would your advice be pastorally uh, for people who are in that situation that, uh, that want to have peace in their own households and their own communities? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's things in a sense that we already know. A lot of listening and a lot of just sit, being prepared to sit down and, and preferably face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. Like you, you need to get past the social media stuff. You need to push past the email stuff. You lose so much on those platforms yeah. and through those modes of communication. So get that person in front of you, sit down with a nice cup of tea and get eyeball to eyeball and listen mm. and have them share their story and their experiences and their perspectives and have an open heart and a soft heart. Don't go into that conversation just with a whole lot of ammunition to win the argument and and lob a few you know verbal grenades over the fence yep. uh, but listen and and be be open to having your own views modified and then as the opportunity comes up you you share your story and, and share your perspective but i think it's it's things that we see all the way through scripture the importance of personal presence with one another embodied personal presence yep. relationship being quick to listen slow to speak slow to become angry. Those are the ways that we're going to find our way through uh, all sorts of disagreements and also being prepared just to be okay with disagreement. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can be heard uh, without having to be right or without having to persuade and convince the other person to your point of view. So be okay to sit with that. Mm. Now, very good uh, wisdom and advice as always, Ruben. Thank you so much for your time on the program today. Kia ora. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Andrew.